What's up everyone? Welcome or welcome back to what's going to be an amazing week here at Eastside. My name is Norm, this is my friend Daniela, and if you're a guest joining us for the first time, we are so glad to have you here. And way to go on taking those first steps to come check things out. We really hope you enjoy your time today. And for those of you who may not know, we have a really great mobile app you can download that will help you make the most of your time here. The Eastside app doesn't just have information. It's got message notes you can follow, shareable content, links to Gene's podcasts. And for those of you watching on your TVs at home, you can use the Watch Live portal under the Media tab to engage with our community in the chat space. It's a great resource, so feel free to grab your phone right now and go to eastside.com slash app to get it. Today, we continue in our series called You Asked For It. So get ready for a great time together. Eastside starts right now. Welcome to Eastside, where we gather all of us, each in different stage of our spiritual journey, young and old, all races and colors. We don't exist for ourselves, but for people. People that haven't been invited, people that haven't been cared for, who have walked away from God. People of a past that pushes others away. It's about the hurting and those who have lost hope. We gather as one church, not as individuals, not as separate campuses, but as a family pushing towards the same thing, knowing that Jesus was not for the select few, but for all of us. We believe Jesus is the hope in a world of darkness, and it's through his church that the world will find light. We believe who we choose to be today will determine the world of tomorrow. So we have a vision, to begin each day with purpose, to open our hearts and minds to learn something new, 
to let go of our comfortable living, to reach the searching, the broken, the hurting, to focus on what really matters, to band together and fight against the darkness, a vision to be the church Jesus called us to be. This isn't just a church. Eastside is a movement of people who gather together with Jesus declaring, this is for everyone.
but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide, because you're good on your promise. I'll take you at your word. If you say fell in line I know cause I've seen it in my life to narrow road that leads to life but I want to be on it it's a narrow road the tide is high but you're part of the water I'll take you
turn and grab a seat if you would. It's good to sing true words, isn't it? Um, hey, my name is Scott, and I get to help out with our Next Gen teams here at Eastside, and I also occasionally get to uh, set up communion moments, and I was thinking about that this week, and sometimes um, when I do this, I like to bring a little something with me. Maybe it's just because my mind is simple, and it helps me to, to focus on a concept, and uh, today, this is all I brought. It's a little uh, spool of thread, and uh, I borrowed it because I don't sew a lot. <laughs> so if you need your mending done, don't drop it at my house. You'd be disappointed. But you've heard the phrase before, I'm guessing, hanging on by a thread, right? When I think about that, I've got a couple of friends that this week, they would say that there's a part of their life where they feel like they're just hanging on by a thread, and I wonder, when you walk into Eastside today, in a room this size, there may be some folks who are going, man, there's a, it's a part of my life, a relationship, a situation, and I feel like I'm just holding on by a thread. There's actually a part in Scripture that addresses that same phrase, and it says, when we forget God, our confidence can feel like it's hanging by a thread. And as we get ready to take communion, I just want to put that out there and say to you, some of you, you can remember a time where you felt like something was hanging by a thread and God came through and we're going to remember that and celebrate that. And others of you, you need that thought right now. You need to remember God and that he's got you. He holds you in his hand. He's got you. If you walked in tonight and you didn't get the communion elements, if you just put your hand up in the air and someone will swing by and make sure that you can participate. If you're uh, joining us online, crackers, bread, juice, whatever you've got, would encourage you to participate as well. And if you're new to this kind of a thing and maybe you're not sure what this is all about, that's okay. You can just sit back and take in these moments. But let's remember what it is that Jesus did for us. He's got us in his hand. You take communion. Oh, the band is going to sing in about a half a minute, but that doesn't mean you need to be done taking communion. 
You just take your time, and they're going to launch into the next worship song. Everything else it will be added. Hold 
That's great, isn't it? You can grab a seat. I know my Father will provide. Love that reminder. Hey, uh, I want to ask you if you can remember the first day that you came to Eastside. I wonder if you could picture what you were feeling as you walked in, maybe the things that you've learned from then until now. Uh, I don't know if you can remember that first day, um, but some people, as you think about that right now, you're going, oh, that's easy. It's today. Today's my first day. And if that's you, I just want to say, so glad that you're here. And I have a special uh, welcome for you, a special invitation to ask you. And is that when you walk out, we would love if you would stop by our guest central uh, little kiosk there, because we want to give you a free gift. Uh, Eastside Travel Mug, want to give you, uh, there's a little gift card inside for a meal at our grill. And we just want to say thank you so much for coming here and for making today your first day. Someone would love to be able to give you a personal welcome out there because uh, it's just great that you're here and you decide to spend some time with us. Now, lots of you have been here for maybe a medium time or a long time, and you have been so generous around Eastside. And I want to celebrate that in this moment because God is doing all kinds of things. And, and the unfinished people around here, this unfinished mission that we have together, God is doing great things with your generous giving here. And I just want to remind you, um, there's three ways you could do that. You can scan that QR code and get in on that. You can do it on the Eastside app, and you can give it the get black giving boxes in the back of the room. But I'm super excited about this because God uses that in places like our Next Gen Ministries. And I won't talk too long about this because I have a video I want to show you of a camp that we did at some of our campuses just a couple of months ago. And God used it in incredible ways. And that was underwritten by the generosity of East Center. So take a look. having other people pour into our children so they're not just getting it at home but they're getting it um, on the weekends too. I'm able to really make new connections not only with staff but with the children as well especially as a newer member of Eastside to really connect with everybody here. We think camping ministry is really important. These people are here directly to speak life to them and to, to, to help them grow in their, in their spiritual walk. I think just seeing kids either just take that, it could be a small step or make a huge life change. Um, whether again, they've accepted Jesus. I mean, that's obviously the amazing point where people get to make that change and seeing little kids get it and then start um, making that direction, that shift to want to live their life for Christ. But the choice that we make is that we choose to tell Jesus Yay! Honestly, it's just been an amazing experience, especially seeing su such young girls make such an important choice to give their lives to Jesus and to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I prayed over them, asking God for guidance throughout their lives. So it's really, it's honestly such a touching moment for me, um, but also such a blessing to be a part of their journey. Um, so I'm really, really grateful um, just for this entire experience. See the effects of God sometimes, right, and change lives. And I hope Candace walks out of here knowing that 100% she is essential. She is guiding and leading and directing. She's a, a familiar face. She's a someone that is there to encourage. She's just someone that is um, really important to everything that we do here uh, at camp and in Kidside. For today and in Jesus' name, amen. I love that. I love that. Yeah, he clapped for that. And the exciting thing is we have summer camps that our registrations are already open for and people are signing up at all of our age group levels. I want to encourage you, uh, if you have a kid, we know that you're trying to point them towards Jesus and we want to come alongside you in that uh, effort. And we think this is one of the best dollars that you could spend investing uh, in the spiritual life of your kids. So just want to welcome you to check that out. You can scan that QR code and get information on our camps uh, as well. Other reaction I just want to give to that is maybe you look at Candace and you're like, man, maybe I could make a difference for a kid. You don't have to go all the way to camp to do that. You could stop by one of the kids' side rooms tonight and say, hey, how might I check this out? Could I like kind of kick the tires and observe some weekend? And they will help you know how to be able to do that. So, hey, with no further delay, I want to turn the corner towards the next week in our series you asked for it. Our Anaheim campus pastor, Jake Barker, is going to come uh, and give a great uh, message. I've heard it already, excited about it. If you want to pull out your phone, uh, the Eastside app has a note section that's pretty cool that you can follow along with the outline and the scriptures. Uh, just want to say really, really glad that you are with us uh, at Eastside.
All right, what's up, everyone? Hope you're having a great weekend so far. Welcome to Eastside. My name is Jake, and I get to be one of the pastors here on the team. And I'm really excited for week two of this series. What I'm convinced of is that you are here for a reason, and God has something for you today. If you're new around Eastside, then you need to know that one of the unique wrinkles of this place is that we are one church that meets in seven different locations. So that means one vision, one mission, one heartbeat, but we get to meet all over the country and thanks to our online campus, truly all over the world. For instance, any given week, there are people regularly tuning in from Spain and Canada and the Philippines. So shout out to our international crew. We love you. We're so glad that you're here. And keep making some noise for all of our east side locations. That's Bellflower, Park Rapids, Redlands, Vegas, Irvine, Online, Anaheim. So glad you made this part of your weekend. Hey, last weekend, Gene kicked off this new message series called You Asked For It. And he kicked it off uh, by answering the question, are we living in the end times? And it was really powerful, really helpful. Encourage you to go check it out. It's even more relevant because of the current events that are happening right now. And so not only would I encourage you to go check out that message, but continue praying for the citizens and the innocent lives that are caught up in all of that right now. We want to keep sending our prayers and keep giving it to God right here in this moment. But over the next few weeks, we are going to tackle some of the biggest questions about following Jesus. More specifically, we're going to address what are often articulated as some of the primary barriers that keep people from following Jesus in the first place. And what I'm confident of is that if we can address them directly and allow God's word to speak on them, you will find not only some clarity, but you'll find a lot of hope in the process. Now, if you, if you call this place home, my guess is that at some point in your life, whether it was at the break room at work or in the cafeteria at school or in the front yard with a neighbor, someone walked up to you and they said, hey, you, you like go to church, right? Or you're, you're a Christian, right? What do you think about this? And then they dropped one of those questions on you. One of those questions that is like super complicated to answer or one of those questions that might make it a little awkward between the two of you or, or maybe just one of those questions that you yourself weren't exactly sure what the answer was. And I remember a couple Christmases ago, uh, I invited one of my friends, JJ, he's a worship leader here, to come over and hang out after one of the nights of multiple Christmas services. And we were whipped and tired and we're hanging around a fire pit and just really talking about nothing important. And then later, late at night, uh, our, my neighbor came over, sat down and wanted to hang out, which was awesome. And he looked at me and he said, so like, what's your deal? Right. What, what do you believe? And I'm thinking inside, I think this dude wants me to explain the entirety of Christianity to him at 11 p.m. And my battery's on 5%. <laughs> but I guess I got to go. And so I gave him the most perfectly imperfect answer that I could come up with. Because you just never know when the question is coming or what it's going to be. And so over the coming weeks, we hope to give you some tools that will help you answer the questions for your friends and family, or maybe they'll help you answer your own questions. Maybe you're here today and you would say, man, I'm, I'm actually still unconvinced. I don't know that I believe everything that you guys believe in, and I just want you to know I'm so glad you're here. Our unofficial motto here at Eastside is that this is for everyone. Notice the motto is not, this is for those that have all the answers. It is definitely not, this is for those who got their act together, or else I wouldn't be here. Uh, this is for everyone. This is for the question askers and the cynics. This is for the curious and the seekers. We want you to keep coming around and keep asking really good questions. Uh, you and I, we live in this moment in time where our culture could easily be described as a hot take culture, especially with the advent of social media, the best way of getting attention right now is by having a contrarian opinion about a popular subject. While everyone is going in this direction, you go in that direction. While everyone else is zigging, you zag, and then you get the attention you so desperately desire. 
So for instance, when the debate about the greatest basketball player of all time happens, it's usually a choice between Michael Jordan or LeBron James. One of them has more rings, the other one has more points. One of them starred in Space Jam, the other one started in Space Jam 2. Okay, who is the greatest? Now, a hot take would be for you to come in and say, actually, it's not MJ or LeBron, it's Magic. Magic was the true Laker. He won championships with style, and now he owns 125 Starbucks, making him a very successful businessman. He's the GOAT. Now, before you showed up today, you had no idea how many Starbucks Magic Johnson owns, but now you do. This is why you come to church. You got to learn stuff, okay? Um, The debate about the best household pet. It's usually between dogs or cats. I mean, look how happy that dog is to run to his owner. And then look how this cat does not care if you are dead or alive. That's the difference between the two. But a hot take would be coming in and saying, actually, it's not dog or cat. It's a snake. A snake is the best pet. And if you're here today, honestly, at any of our locations and you're a snake person, if you could just raise your hand real high, uh, we're making a list of people that we just need to keep an extra eye on. All right. Just a little suspicious. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Then there's the final debate about the perfect pizza topping. Is it just pepperoni or is it a pizza with everything? But the hot take would be to come in and say, no, 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 it's pineapple. Pineapple is the best topping. And if you're, if you're one of those pineapple people, like, what are you doing, man? Like, you know, you know better. You just make things complicated. Hot takes are your opinion. It's just subjective. Like, you can't actually argue it. There's no way of proving if you're right or if you're wrong or if it's true or if it's false. It's just your take. It's your opinion. Now, here's where it's gotten tricky, is that our opinion-based worldview has actually made its way into some of our big beliefs about life beliefs about God, beliefs about human flourishing. What we've done is we've exchanged the absolute and universal truths that apply to everyone. And we said, well, actually, it's all a matter of opinion. There's no way one thing could be true for everyone. And so that makes everything just subjective. And it's made its way into our fundamental understandings about who God is. It's made its way into the way that we receive the holy teachings about relationships. We say that's just a matter of opinion. It's the way we see God's blueprint for our physical bodies and the design that he gave us. We say, well, it's it's just what you think. It even has gone into the teachings that may determine our eternal destination. And we say, well, what's true for you isn't necessarily true for me. And so uh, that makes the question number two in this series all the more difficult to answer. And here's our second question in this You Ask For It series. Is Jesus the only way to God? Is Jesus the only way? In this question, there's one word that's doing the majority of the heavy lifting, and that's the word only. If there is a way to God, why is it that Jesus is the only way? Now, philosophers and thought leaders many years ago were convinced that as humanity advanced and technology developed, then our need to believe in God would either decrease or disappear altogether. The more self-sufficient that we could get, the less need we would have for God. But if you pay attention to the global trends, the exact opposite has happened. If you look at places like Africa and Korea and China, Faith communities have exploded in growth, even despite some severe outside opposition. And even in America, spirituality is still prevalent. In a recent Pew Research poll, uh, 80% of the respondents identified as either spiritual, religious, or both. So that means 80% of your friends, 80% of your coworkers, 80% of the people at your school would be open to some kind of spirituality. But then in a separate poll, the same percentage, 80%, said that religion is losing influence in the public life. So what we believe is no longer the guiding principle behind how we live or our relationships or how we treat one another. And if I were to summarize those two sets of data points, I'd put it like this. Our culture is spiritual but not specific. 
we're open to the idea of a higher power, uh, something else that's in charge, maybe even a God, but we don't want to get too narrow about how we define it. And so that's how people in your life start talking about things like the universe. The universe is in charge. The universe is in control. The universe opens doors for me. The universe will provide what I need. And here's my hunch as to why we prefer this vague spirituality is because as long as it's the universe, then that means that I don't have the weight of the world on my shoulders. I don't want that. That seems like a lot of work. I don't want to be in charge. But I also don't want it to be so specific that it tells me how to live. So I can keep it at an arm's distance as this vague spiritual thing like the universe, where the universe is in charge, but the universe never tells me what to do with my body. The universe never tells me how to treat my money. The universe never actually asks me to forgive anyone. And so I'll keep it vague so that I can believe in something bigger, but never have to change the way I live. And today we are going to evaluate one of the central claims of Christianity. And I'm just warning you, it is specific, like pinpoint accuracy level specific. But if you hang with me, what I believe is that if we look at it from all the angles, what may make you initially uncomfortable because of its specificity, you'll discover to be an invitation into a life of hope and joy and peace. And so we need to figure out to begin with, where did this idea come from? How did we ever come to the conclusion that Jesus was the only way to God? And the short answer is Jesus. It's actually a response to his own claim about himself. If you have a Bible or a Bible app and you want to follow along, then we're going to be in John chapter 14. So you can get a head start and head that way. And in John chapter 14, at this point in the life of Jesus and his ministry, he's at this dinner party that is now famously known as the Last Supper. Even if you didn't grow up in church, you've at least seen the famous painting where Jesus and all of his disciples are inexplicably sitting around only one side of the table. I don't know why they were doing that, but that's the way they were positioned. And during this dinner party, Jesus did some very unique and thought-provoking things. First, he started out by tying a towel around his waist and then washing the feet of his disciples. This was a task that was normally reserved for the lowest of low servants. But here was the son of God washing the feet of his disciples. After he was done with that, he looks at all of them and he predicts that one of the 12 will betray him, sell them out, hand them over. And that launches a very intense game of guess who amongst the disciples around the table. And then after he's done with that, he looks at his most outspoken disciple, Peter, and he predicts that Peter will deny his allegiance to Jesus three times before the night is over. This party goes from awkward to tense and everyone is on edge. And then Jesus says this, John chapter 14, beginning in verse one, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. And trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I'll come get you. And so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going. So how can we know the way? I love this interaction between Jesus and one of his disciples, Thomas. Uh, Jesus, at this dinner party, is trying to prepare the disciples for what's about to happen. This three-year run where they spent almost every moment together is coming to a close. Jesus is going to leave them, prepare a place for eternity, come back and get them so that they can spend eternity together. And then Jesus looks at all of them and says, you're going to know the way to get there. And at that moment, Thomas, one of my favorites, he raises his hand. He says, Jesus, we have no idea what you are talking about. Quite frankly, over the last three years, we have rarely understood what you were talking about. He, Jesus just saw things that they didn't see. He knew things that they didn't know. And he would often speak in ways that left the disciples just scratching their heads. 
And the reason I'm so encouraged by this snapshot in Jesus' life is because Jesus had created such a trusting relationship with his disciples that they could freely and comfortably look him in the eye and say, Jesus, we don't get it. I'm confused. My brain hurts just trying to understand. Jesus, will you explain it? And the reason that I love it so much is because I find myself in that position all the time. Maybe you do too. When I'm talking to God, I'm often saying, God, what are you saying? I mean, you want me to leave where? You want me to go there? You want me to talk to them? I do not understand why you're saying what you're saying. And if you come in here and and you don't always feel supremely confident in what you believe, you feel like there's more that you don't know than you do about God, I'm just here to tell you God is not irritated. He's not annoyed with your confusion or questions. Jesus had cultivated that kind of relationship with his disciples. But sometimes God does answer our questions directly. And when God answers our question, it's our responsibility to respond to what he said. Earlier in the service, we all sang a song that we promised to take him at his word. And so here is the way Jesus responded to Thomas's question. So Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So if our culture is spiritual but not specific, Jesus went in the exact opposite direction. He could not have been more clear. The idea that Jesus is the only way to God is not the random idea of a random group of people in a random room one day. We are responding to a direct quote from Jesus. At home, I have a 14-year-old daughter. She's a freshman in high school. And on many nights, she'll be laboring over a homework assignment. And she'll look up and she'll say, Dad, am I ever going to use this when I'm an adult? And as a father who is invested in her academic success and loves her very much, I will look right back at her and say, nope, (laughs) but I had to learn it when I was a kid. And now you got to learn it because you're a kid. And that's just the way life goes. But at some point in your schooling, you had a grammar lesson. And in that grammar lesson, you learned about parts of speech. And when you were learning about parts of speech, you learned about the definite article, the which is singular and focused. And so when Jesus was talking, he was using a definite article saying, I am definitely the way. I am definitely the truth. I am not a truth amongst other equally valid truths. He claims to be the one and only truth. And he is the life. And so it's our responsibility to respond to what Jesus said about himself. The question is, is that true? And then how would that shape the way that we live? Now, it's not new for us in our day and age to be the ones that are stumbling over this claim. What Jesus said about himself has been tripping people up for the last 2,000 years. And so I want to acknowledge three of the primary objections to Jesus' claim about himself. So objection number one sounds like this. It's arrogant to claim that you have the truth. That's what most of our world would say. It's it's a position of pride to say out of all the 8 billion people in the world, and a lot of them disagree with you, that to say that you have the truth. Doesn't that make you smarter than other people? Doesn't that mean you think you're better than other people? And so because our world looked at it as a position of pride, our culture's response was to encourage tolerance. I don't know about you, when I was a kid in school, that was like the buzzword. We were supposed to learn to be tolerant of one another. And what that meant in the moment was that we were supposed to acknowledge that other people live differently than us, look differently than us, think differently than us, and we should tolerate each other's differences. But then our culture gravitated from tolerance to affirmation. And so we said, not only do you have to allow for all these ideas to exist, but you have to affirm each of them as equally true. And that makes it really complicated. Again, we would like to think that we're really special and we're new to all this, but this way of thinking has been around for a really long time. 
In fact, there's a story from Hindu lore in India that tried to make the same point. The story goes like this. There's a group of blind men that discover an elephant, and they try to describe it to one another. And so the first blind man goes up to the elephant and feels the tusk and says, oh, an elephant is like a sword. But then the another blind man grabs the tail of the elephant and says, what are you talking about? No, an elephant is like a rope. Still another blind man grabs the foot of an elephant and says, guys, both of you are wrong. This is like a tree. And the moral of the story is supposed to be that all of these men were right and all of them were wrong. They had a piece of the picture, but they didn't have the whole picture. And so as a group of human people, we have a slice of the picture, but we don't see it all. All of us are right and all of us are wrong. And I know at first glance, that seems like a very loving and tolerant thing. We can affirm one another, but here's where the story falls apart. There's one person in the story that isn't blind. It's the narrator. The narrator is sitting outside saying, guys, it's an elephant. I see the whole elephant. I see the whole story. You guys just have a piece of the truth while I see it all. In fact, it is impossible for us to go throughout our lives without making some kind of claim to the truth. Even if you show up today and you would say, I think it's wrong because no one can know the truth. That itself is a truth claim. It's impossible to avoid. We all do it. Then we get to objection number two, and it's more relational in tone. And we say, it's mean to say someone is wrong. I don't want to be mean by disagreeing with someone. And and some of you, you read that statement on the screen. You're like, oh, I don't have a problem telling people they're wrong. I tell them they're wrong all the time. And it's like, we know. All right. That's why you don't have friends. You should you should really be nicer to people. But culturally, we've gotten to the place where we say, well, it's mean to tell anyone that they're wrong about what they believe. And we've said that if you love me or if you even like me, then it is your obligation to affirm everything about me. You have to affirm the way I think. You have to affirm what I believe. You have to affirm all my relationships. And if you don't, it falls somewhere between hurtful and hateful. We've actually misaligned uh, disagreement with bigotry. And friends, that is a shallow uh, shallow view of relationships. Disagreement is not the same thing as disrespect. There is a way of being disrespectful when you disagree with someone. The words that you choose, the, the tone that you take, your willingness to condescend them, all of that is disrespectful. But in certain situations in life, the most loving thing we can do for someone is disagree with them. If we watch someone that we love stay in a dangerous or even abusive relationship that they are unwilling to leave, isn't the most loving thing we can do to disagree with them? As a parent, it would be foolish of me to affirm my children's desire to play in the street because I know the danger that is coming that could lead to their death. Sometimes the most loving thing we can do is disagree with someone. Now, the challenge that we're wrestling with today is, is our belief in Jesus a matter of opinion or is it a matter of life and death? I like the way author Rebecca McLaughlin put it. She said, if I say Christianity is true and Hinduism, Islam and Buddhism are not, Is that like saying, stop smoking, it could kill you? Something that you would lovingly tell someone you care about? Or is it more like saying, my grandmother's cooking is better than yours? Is it a matter of life and death? Or is it just your opinion? Here's objection number three. Uh, We will often get to the point where we say, I can like Jesus, but I don't have to follow him. I guess is you got someone in your life that they say, I'm cool with Jesus. I just don't want to have to be a Christian. I don't want to have to follow him for the rest of my life. In fact, most of our world would look at Jesus and admire him. It's hard not to. When you hear, hear about the revolution of love he unleashed in that community, you're like, man, that was pretty cool. When you see the way that he acknowledged the disadvantaged and the disabled when everyone else 
was ignoring them. It's, it's really easy to admire Jesus. And so we say, I don't, I don't have to be a follower of his. I'll just be a casual fan. And the problem with that way of thinking is that Jesus never left us that option. He never said that we could like him. He said he wanted us to follow him. In the final book of the Bible called Revelation, Jesus is addressing some of the churches that existed at the time. And there was this one church in Laodicea, and they liked Jesus. They, they were cool with him. They, they had his book on the shelf. They, they had one of his quotes in their Instagram bio. They had the t-shirt. Like, they were down with Jesus. It was cool. But then Jesus wrote this to that church. He said, I know all the things you do, but you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. This church in Laodicea, they were fans of Jesus because they didn't feel like they really needed Jesus. Did you notice the detail that John wrote for us? He said they were super rich. They were loaded. They could pay the bills. They put food on the table. They went to one of those tropical vacations every year, and they just didn't feel like they needed God for much. They liked him, but they didn't need him. And Jesus says, you may not reject me, but I'm going to reject you. It's either a life of full devotion or a full rejection. But this middle ground was never an option. I mean, when you think about the claim that Jesus made, he said he was God and he was the only way to God. That demands a response. We can't just be indifferent towards someone that said something like that. Imagine later this weekend, someone you went to high school with jumps on your feed and they post that they are the son of God. You would know what to do with that claim. You would just immediately reject it. You're like, bro, I sat next to you in Spanish class. You are not God. I heard all the crude jokes you made in the locker room. You definitely are not God. It would be an easy rejection. But somehow when we've approached Jesus, we say, I like a lot of the stuff he said, even though he said that kind of wild thing about him being the only way to God. It demands a response. Author C.S. Lewis said, Jesus is either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. Either he's someone that was so self-involved and narcissistic that he created an entire religion about himself and he deserves to be rejected. Or he was a lunatic, someone mentally unwell that made claims of grandiosity and we can reject that too. Or he is genuinely the son of God that showed up to do what you and I couldn't, loved us that much and he deserves our full devotion. It's either full devotion or a full rejection. The middle ground was never an option. And before you leave our time today and you choose to reject Jesus as the only way to God, I'd like to describe to you exactly what you would be rejecting. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus said he was the way, what did he mean? Like the, the way to where, where are we going? And Jesus was saying to us that he is the way to a right relationship with God. Jesus is the only way to where God goes from our spiritual boss to our heavenly father. And those relationships are different, aren't they? Our spiritual boss is one out of obligation. We fear him. We perform for him. And then someday we'll get an employee review to tell us whether we were in or out. And then Jesus says, actually, I want to take you to a heavenly father that loves you and gives you an identity, comforts you, and has provided a place of eternity. I've already kind of told you I got kids at home, and one of them is our two-year-old daughter. Her name is Cozy. Uh, this is a picture of her on her second birthday. I know. And uh, this, she was walking around Disney World like she owns the place. Um, we may have instilled too much self-confidence in this little girl. It's really going to come back to bite us. But she started doing this thing at home where when the music's playing, she'll walk over to the couch and she'll take all five of her little fingers and she'll wrap them around one of your fingers and pull you off the couch. Then she'll walk you over to the baby gate, not because she wants through or over, 
but because she wants to hold on to it and then do ballet dances like this. Okay, that's what she wants to do. And then she looks at you and expects you to do the same, and you do because she looks like that. And so as you're doing these dances, I'm just looking at her as her father in a puddle of affection saying, little girl, I would do anything for you. There's not a dollar I wouldn't spend. There is not a night I wouldn't lose sleep. There is not a high school boy I would not beat up. I would do anything for you. No limits at times. It is scary to know the depths of what I would do for my children. And friends, I am like the world's okayest dad. I'm fine. Some days I get it right. More often than not, I don't. And what Jesus is inviting you into is a way to get into a restored relationship with the perfect dad. The perfect dad that says you don't have to worry about being fired by your divine boss anymore. You're a much-loved daughter or son of his forever. So Jesus is the way. Then Jesus said he's the truth. He's the truth, singular in nature. He's the one and only truth. And one of the popular developments in our cultural vernacular is that we've started talking about your truth. As if you can have a version of truth and then I can have a version of truth and they don't have to be the same thing. You just make up your own. And even though logic eventually falls apart with that, I understand the sentiment and that's every single one of us is living for something. You got some kind of purpose, some kind of driving force, some reason to wake up in the morning. Usually early in our life, we decide that we're going to live for ideas. That's what a lot of young people do. They say, well, I'm going to be idealistic and and I'm going to be the most accepting and affirming and tolerant person in the world. I don't care what you do, what you believe, what you say, how you express. You're welcome here. I will affirm everything about you. I will tolerate it all. And then one day you meet that person that breaks your tolerant limit. Their morality was so corrupt, their politics so incompatible, their lifestyle so vile that you say, apparently I wasn't as tolerant as I wanted. Actually, what I was saying is that I will tolerate a whole lot of people that are just like me. Our ideas let us down. Then we say, well, okay, maybe I'll just be generous. I'll just give it all away. And then one day you meet someone that's even more generous than you. Our ideas put this pressure on our shoulders that we have to perform for them over and over and over, and it lets us down. So then we move on from our ideas, and we find people in our lives, and we'll say, oh, I'll live for them now. I'll live for my family. I'll live for my friends. Often we find a romantic partner, and we say, oh, I'll live for them now. And then just a few days later, we realize that they're just as imperfect as we are. And they, too, have trauma that they've yet to deal with. And in the middle of the night, they leave the toilet seat up. And we realize that is not what I thought it was going to be at all. And we have to perform for these people. And they say, as long as you do the right things, you'll still be loved. But the minute you do the wrong thing, you might be out. It's a lot of pressure. Then Jesus comes in and says, he is the truth. And he's the truth that forgives. He's the truth that knows the truth about you. He's the truth that showed up to live the perfect life you and I couldn't pull off, to pay the price for our sin that we couldn't afford, to overcome our enemy death that you and I couldn't defeat. And now he's promised us a perfect eternity that you and I couldn't earn. Jesus is the only truth that doesn't say you have to get it right. Every other religion, every other secular worldview says, if you perform well enough, you will be loved. And God came along and said, I love you just as you are. I'll change you. I'll grow you. I'm not done with you yet, but I love you. That is the truth. Finally, Jesus invites us into the life, a life that's no longer defined by how we perform for God, but by what God did for us. It's actually Jesus's perfection that is counted as Hours. That's the life. What a life of freedom. I don't have to prove anything. I don't have to earn anything. I just get to live in the joy of grace. So as we wrap up today, I want to talk to two different groups of people. Uh, maybe you walked in here today and you were already convinced. You're like, yeah, I, I've already believed that. I've, I've believed that for a long time, that Jesus is the only way to God. And, and to you, I would say that the only response in our life should be unending patience and love and kindness 
with those that don't believe what we believe, those that don't yet agree with us. We have to be gentle and kind and encouraging to them as they are in the process. Unfortunately, the truth about Jesus and him being the way to God has been used as a blunt forced instrument. Sometimes it's used as a mic drop moment in a Facebook argument that finally wins the day and it's never what it was intended for. It says that God's kindness, his loving kindness is what leads us to repentance. And so let us treat people the same way. And then there are others of you here today and, and you walked in unconvinced, you walked in here maybe in that like friend zone with Jesus, you liked him, you were in the middle, but you never committed. And I just need you to know that you are responding to the words of Jesus himself. He said full devotion or full rejection but the middle wasn't an option. And before you reject him, may I remind you that he is the way into a loving relationship with God the Father. He is the truth that forgives. He is the life that says you don't have to earn it or perform anymore. And this is your day. This is your moment, your line in the sand where you can say, I'm all in. I believe Jesus and I take him at his word. And if that's you today, you just need a moment to make it official. I'd love to pray a prayer for you. And you can pray this with me and make this your moment. Will you pray with me? Father, we are coming to you. And we know that uh, we know what you've done for us. We know the way you loved us and what you overcame so that, so that we could experience this freedom. God, we want to make this our moment. We're in. No more of this riding the fence and no more of this a little bit of in and a little bit of out, but we want to love you. We want to follow you. We want to be fully devoted followers of you and watch you change our lives and the lives of everyone around us. God, we trust you. We love you. We want to follow you. It's in your son's perfect name, I pray. Amen. Hey, can I just say, before you clap, before you clap, can I just say that anyone who received that offer that Jake was describing there and prayed that, it is a life-changing moment. And if you stepped across that, I'm not going to make you raise your hand or do anything like that, but gosh, we celebrate with you. And now we could applaud for anyone who made that kind of a decision because that's good. That's good, good news. And it's great news that Jesus is the one way. So, Isad, um, so good to be reminded of those things. Uh, I want to tell you, as you're getting ready to kind of turn the corner, uh, we're going to pick this up again next week with another installment of You Asked For It. But before you head on out, I just uh, also want to say the grill is open. It's a little sprinkly outside, but they've moved it indoors into Common C. So I want to encourage you to stop by there. And again, if today is your first Eastside day, would you stop at Guest Central on your way out, look somebody in the eye, say, hey, I'm new, and they'd love to be able to just greet you, give you a gift, and the whole thing. So Eastside, so great to be with you. So great to celebrate the gift that we have. Have a great weekend. I am really loving the series we're in, and I hope it's an encouragement to all of you. Remember, if you're in the US and new to Eastside, go to eastside.com slash connect and let us know where to mail your free gift. It's an Eastside travel mug. We love you, Eastside. Thanks again for joining us, and we will see you next weekend for part three of our message series called You Asked For It. Take care.